Hello, and welcome to CropFlix, our 2021 virtual crop management conference. I am Chelsea Harbach, and I am going to talk to you about where we're at with the soybean cyst nematode problem in Illinois. Uh, I am a commercial egg extension educator with the University of Illinois, and I am uh, headquartered at the um, the Northwestern Illinois Agriculture Research and Demonstration Center in uh, Monmouth in the western part of the state. And that's the little wormy um, I'll be talking about. So uh, to talk about soybean cyst nematode first, I want to talk about when, when we first became aware of this problem. Uh, soybean cyst nematode was first identified in the United States in 1954. Um, it was found first found in North Carolina, um, later found in the um, boot hills of Missouri. And from there, it really started to, um, to spread throughout the, the United States, so I've been producing uh, areas. And um, you can see on, on this GIF here, um, it kind of made, it, made a big jump to north central Iowa, south central Minnesota. Um, that kind of was probably the catalyst for the beginning of the spread throughout um, the rest of Iowa into Minnesota, the Dakotas, and Nebraska. Um, and then uh, clearly the Illinois spread started from that Missouri um, kind of infection point. Um, and I, I do think it's really important to note um, for, um, for everyone to be aware that this, uh, this nematode is not one like our, um, it, it's, it's not one that will move on its own from field to field. It is, it is much too small um, to, to be doing that. So it's actually um, only moved via passive transport. And, and that's largely where we're gonna be getting the spread of this nematode throughout the soybean growing regions in the United States is this, um, this transmission um, via soil particles. Anything that can carry soil particles can carry soybean cyst nematode um, and that, that includes water, equipment, shoes, even wind. Um, so you have to be mindful of that just because you, you don't have a soybean cyst nematode problem now doesn't mean that you can't easily end up with a soybean cyst nematode problem later. And the way that we've managed soybean cyst nematode to date um, is going to have an impact on what those soybean cyst nematode populations um, are like that are going to be moving that could be moving into into your fields. So the soybean cyst nematode being a nematode is obviously um, it's a roundworm. It's a plant parasitic roundworm. This nematode hatches as a second stage juvenile. Um, so it goes through its first molt in the egg in the soil and hatches as a second stage juvenile. And this is the only infective stage of the soybean cyst nematode. As a second stage juvenile, it will migrate to, to find plant roots to enter and ideally, it's enter for, ideally for the nematode, it's entering a soybean root where it will form a specific feeding cell where it will stay for the rest remainder of its life. Um, I think it's important to highlight this uh, second stage juvenile um, in infective stage of the nematode because this is um, also the most vulnerable stage of the nematode. Uh, so any, you know, in soil um, management methods we might consider are going to be targeted towards this one very, very short window. Uh, so, so you can imagine that, um, you know, management in the soil is, isn't gonna be super effective against this nematode. Um, and I'll talk about that more in a little bit. Um, after the nematode enters the roots, I said, as I mentioned, it will stay, stay there for the remainder of its life. Um, it will go through um, a few subsequent molts. Um, it'll uh, 
become a third stage juvenile, fourth stage juvenile. After that, um, the nematodes will uh, ha have sexual dimorphism. You'll see males will exit the 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 roots and the females stay. Um, the males go out and and copulate with the females, and then the females start to fill up with eggs. So this here is a picture of a mature soybean cyst nematode cyst. Um, this is would be a dead female. Uh, the females actually um, they die because their bodies fill up with eggs and the eggs squish their internal organs. Uh, so that's kind of interesting, and you can see just how many eggs. Um, eggs you can see in one cyst and in, in addition to the cyst or the eggs that she forms uh, in her body she also um, produces some eggs in a gelatinous matrix outside of her body um, so it's it's a highly prolific pathogen and you can see this uh, from hatch to to cyst in about 30 days you can have hundreds of eggs form per um, per female uh, it, it, so it's a it's a highly highly damaging um, or ha has a high reproductive potential and thus can be really damaging on our soybean crops and with that um, that fairly short life cycle um, as long as the um, soil conditions are favorable for hatching and um, you know migrating into the roots you can see three to four generations of the soybean cyst nematode per season and it's largely that it its prolific nature is definitely um, contributes to the fact that this uh, this nematode is has been the top yield suppressing pathogen on soybean in the United States for more than twenty years, and it's it's one that I think we've kind of thought that we've had under control, but. Um, but it tends to go unnoticed because you can actually have up to 30% yield suppression from the soybean, um, or from the soybean cyst nematode before you see any above ground symptoms. So it's, it's one that you might not be aware is a problem um, and you might be attributing yield suppression to something else, but um, you know, it's worth uh, investigating whether or not uh, you, know, you might have a soybean cyst nematode problem. When it comes to managing this uh, this nematode, we've largely relied on host resistance and crop rotation. As I mentioned that um, the vulnerable stage of the nematode is that second stage juvenile stage and it is such a short window that, um, that getting the nematode at its most vulnerable is really difficult. So using host resistance is, is gonna be one of the more, more reliable ways to manage one of the most, truly the most reliable way to manage soybean cyst nematode. And then of course, crop rotation to a non-host um, crop is going to help uh, reduce those, those uh, populations. However, once you have a SCN infestation in your field, it's one that never goes away. You can't eradicate this pest. Um, crop rotation will help only to an extent. Um, the, those, um, those eggs in the cysts, the, the cysts is, is a, you know, the hardened cuticle of the female. It's a really great protective barrier for those eggs against all the elements in the soil. So they can, they can survive in the soil for a very long time. Now specifically when it comes to host resistance, as with anything, uh, you know, it's going to be ideal to rotate your sources of resistance and attempt to, um, Mitigate the the development of any um, any ability of the, the that population to overcome that source of resistance in the field. So with that, um, it's going to be important to also talk about the sources of resistance that we know of, um, and there are these um, seven seven sources of resistance here to um, SCN that we know of, and. Uh, Unfortunately, the, the, the market is dominated by one single source of resistance, and that is PI88788. You can see that here by this graph. Um, this is from Tilka and Mulaney from Iowa State. 
they are documenting the number of commercial um, soybean varieties in maturity groups 0, 1, 2, and 3 uh, for Iowa farmers from 1991 to 2018. Um, the blue line is the number of varieties with PI8878 source of resistance, and the red line is the other sources of SCN resistance, which are mostly Peking. And you can see just, uh, you can see the disparity um, between the two, between PI8878 and other sources of resistance. Uh, so, the, yeah, the market is just uh, absolutely saturated with PI8878 source of resistance. So then as one would expect, um, you know, when, when relying on a single source of resistance or management methods such as a single source of resistance, uh, you know, we, we see this, this storm kind of brewing when it comes to, um, you know, trying to manage SCN with, um, with host resistance. Uh, documented here from McCarville et al., you can see um, the reproductive factors on the y-axis, and that is, um, that's a metric that we use to assess the, um, the reproduction of SCN throughout a growing season by comparing the population density at the beginning of the season with the population density at harvest. Um, so a larger number and anything above one is going to indicate an overall increase in population density throughout the growing season. And you can see here um, the y-axis for PI88788 um, go, goes up to 525, um, Peking goes up to 225. Um, we have overall a lot more um, varieties with a high reproductive factor um, in of the varieties that have the PI88788 source of resistance compared to those with Peking source of resistance. However, these, as I mentioned, these Peking varieties aren't as readily available for farmers um, to use as these PI88788 source of resistance. So we're continually using the same source of resistance and likely, likely building populations of soybean cyst nematode um, in which that PI88788 source of resistance is not as effective. So that leads us to, um, to the topic of um, what the data I'm going to be presenting to you. Um, Nathan Klachewski, he, um, he initiated this HG-type survey of um, soybean cyst nematode populations in Illinois in 2018. Uh, and to date, um, we've surveyed 29 counties, and that is of um, 102 counties in, in the state, um, and that's for both 2018 and 2019. The 2020 results are pending. And for reference of... Uh, you know where in the state those samples have come from. Uh, here's this map. Um, so you can see clearly there's a lot of the state that we're missing, uh, but you know it's likely that the story that is told from the data that we get from, from these counties isn't going to be much different from the other counties, though we would like to see um, samples from the entire state to get, get you know the best picture possible. But we'll, I'll be sharing the data here from 2018 and 2019. When we do an HG type test, um, the first step is to collect a soil sample. And after we have the soil sample um, uh, sent to the plant clinic, they can uh, conduct this soybean cyst nematode bioassay by, um, by growing those seven different SCN indicator lines in um, the, the soil from the, the, that was collected in the field. And then we can count the number of SCN females that form on the roots of those different indicator lines, um, as well as the, the susceptible control that we use, Li. And um, we can calculate the female index, which is the ratio of the number of females on the, the susceptible cultivar um, against all of the indicators. So that, what that is going to look like um, here, so we've got our seven um, SCN indicator lines, and these are the seeds that we would put in the soil from sampled from the field. 
And then we have our SCN susceptible cultivar included. And we grow those soybeans in the soil for 30 days. And that's enough time, as I mentioned, for um, to go for um, SCN to go through one life cycle. So after 30 days, we can get the females off of the, the roots and, um, and we count the number of females. So for example, this is just, just to set up the example so you understand what we're doing with the HG type test. First, we need to um, determine how many females we see on that SCN susceptible cultivar Lee. Um, let's say we see 250 females. Um, and then on Peking, maybe we see 14, PI 887832, etc., etc. So we take these numbers and calculate the female index. Uh, as I said, it's a ratio of the um, the number of females that form on the susceptible control compared with the number of females on the different indicators, and then um, you know we multiply it by 100. So we have uh, a six for Peking, 13, three, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, now to get to the HG type. We're going to um, compare the female index to um, any female index that is equal to or greater than 10. Uh, we are going to add um, to our HG type. So we list the HG type based on these indicator numbers here. Um, so if we have a female index of 13 for PI 88788, a 10 for PI 209332, and we have another 10 for cloud, we're going to have an HG type of two, five, and seven, which means that um, these sources of resistance do not effectively control um, that, uh, that SCN population, or um, yeah, they're, they're, they're not as effective as, as they should be against the soybean system into a population. So knowing that, that is what we did with, that's what the plant clinic did with all of the, the soil samples collected from this HG type survey. And what we have for, um, for results from that uh, survey, um, we have, a, we look at the female index um, to determine the HG types for, for all of our um, all of our samples and these are the data that we have. So this is um, from both 2018 and 2019. Um, this is a number of samples in the different HG type groupings. And you can see we only had two different um, HG type groupings in both years from all of the soil samples that were collected. The soil samples were either um, HG type 1257 or 257. And, um, the important numbers to remember here in the HG type are going to be um, one and two. One is the Peking source of resistance, and two is the PI88788 source of resistance. Um, so it's clear that there, most of the samples, well, all of the samples can um, overcome that PI88788 source of resistance. And some of them, um, the Peking source of resistance isn't, isn't even an effective um, isn't even uh, going to be an effective way to control that population. So looking just to get a, a better picture of each of these years individually here, we're looking at 91% um, of the samples from 2018 have that HG type 257 compared to 9% 1257. And for 2019, 88% um, were that 257 versus 12% were 1257. But the, um, the real big take home point here is that um, for the, the number of samples that included two in the HG type, which was um, PI88788 source of resistance, we had 100% of the samples um, for which the PI88788 source of resistance does not indicate an effective method of control for those populations. So the management implications of um, having, seeing populations across Illinois uh, that um, can, that 
for which PI 8788 is not an effective source of control. Um, you know, we need to continue leaning on um, this crop rotation with a non host crop. Um, you know, once you identify SCN as a problem in your field, uh, ro rotation is going to be one of the best ways to knock those numbers down. Um, you can see a pretty significant drop just from rotating with a non host crop for a single year. And corn or wheat are going to be, you know, the two, two that we're, we're looking at um, in Illinois. If possible, rotating the sources of resistance should help knock down um, SCN numbers. However, for some of those populations where it looks like um, both Peking and PI-88788 sources of resistance were not effective, there's not really a lot of other options. That, I mean, truly, there are no other options for sources of resistance available on the market for, um, for our farmers. So that's going to be um, that's going to be problematic in the future. You know, hopefully we see more genetic methods be put out there to help um, to help manage SCN because uh, resistance within the plant is is really the the best way the best tool that we have to to manage soybean cyst nematode. There are obviously seed treatments on the market, uh, but the data that um, that have been published to date. Uh, have been very, very, um, extremely uh, variable. They, they're not consistent. Um, in, in some cases it might help, um, but in, you know, many cases there's not, um, there's not a big difference. There's not a big effect on the SCN population. So that's, um, that's going to be kind of a situational thing that you will need to evaluate for yourself. Um, but it, it, it is a possible way to help manage um, SCN. And um, the, the, one of the most important things is going to be um, just being conscious about this soybean cyst nematode problem. We have um, had the luxury of having this um, kind of built-in resistance um, that just kind of inherently comes with all of our commercial so, um, soybean cultivars. Um, and it's one that since, um, you know, the resistance was developed from public um, plant introductions and through like university breeding programs, um, it's one that growers haven't had to pay for. So it's it hasn't been something that we've need, needed to think about a lot, but those, those sources of resistance are failing. They're not, they're not as effective as they used to be. So, um, you know, be conscious of, of this soybean cyst nematode problem. Um, make sure that you soil sample regularly, monitor the problem, uh, and, and make your management decisions accordingly. Uh, that, that's, I hope going to be one of one of the biggest takeaways from this presentation is is uh, we really need to be conscious of the problem, um, and and looking into you know any any mystery yield suppression out there you know it could be soybean cyst nematode. Um, for the state of Illinois, um, I want to go through quick the the different nematode services that the plant clinic provides. Um, in addition to the HG type test, uh, they have the Illinois SCN type test, um, which is a, it's like a limited HG type test where um, they use um, only the, the indicator lines that you can find resistance to commercially. So it's, it's, I think it's about half the cost of an HG type test because it's not as many um, not as much goes into the SCN type test, uh, and it's going to be provide information that is more relevant to producers. For um, for those interested in like research and um, and whatnot, you know you can do the HG type test too. Uh, they also offer just uh, a plain old SCN egg count if you um, just want to figure out if SCN is a problem in a field or see 
If the problem has gotten worse, um, you can collect soil samples to submit to the plant clinic and they will turn around and let you know how many SCN eggs they find in your field. And of course the HG type test. Um, the, the other nematode service they provide is a vermiform nematode count. And um, that's gonna be mostly out of concern for plant parasitic nematodes in corn. Um, but that, that is an additional service that they provide. And this is the, uh, the website for the plant clinic if you want more information about um, their services and how, how to uh, soil sample for the, um, and submit samples and whatnot. So uh, bottom line here, things you got to know when it comes to soybean cyst nematode. It's really important to, again, be conscious of the problem. Um, that includes uh, sampling regu regularly so you know your numbers. Um, we recommend, you know, every three to five years, um, you know, if you know that it's a problem. Um, and so soil sampling occasionally still, even if you have fields where it's not a problem because you never know when it might become a problem. And once you, um, once you understand or know um, when and where SCN is a problem in your fields, it's important to manage accordingly uh, with, you know, resistance, rotation, hopefully rotating sources of, sources of resistance, and any other tools that are out there that you want to use. And with that, um, I thank you. And uh, here um, I'm leaving my email address, and uh, that's my Twitter handle if you want to follow me on Twitter. Uh, my contact information should also be in the bio. And uh, I hope uh, I hope this was useful, and I hope you are enjoying CropFlix.